continuing on uh, on uh, uh, issues of functional form, so we briefly discussed what happened. Uh, you know, the, um, transforming the dependent variable to turn a non-linear model into a linear model that we can estimate with OLS. Uh, you uh, you can also uh, sometimes transform the leave the dependent variable what it was and change the independent variable. So when might you want to do that? Well, suppose that you start with your data set and then uh, you have some variable, say, uh, uh, demand for gasoline, how many people, how many gasoline people are purchased and, uh, and the price of gasoline and you notice that you, you, you know, as good uh, trained uh, data scientists, you start by looking at some pattern in the data and the first thing you decide to do is to run a kernel regression of the demand for gasoline on the price of gasoline. And then you realize that uh, it's really not, doesn't look linear at all. That people have, uh, uh, that, that in some places very steep, in some places much flatter. So it doesn't look that it's going to be characterized nicely by a linear model. On, on the other hand, you wouldn't want to continue working necessarily with a kernel regression because it's a bit heavy going. It's harder to control for other things. And uh, you know, we, know how we, it's a, we know how to nicely represent kernel regression as bivariate things. But then when it becomes multivariate, it's kind of harder to look at. So you would really move to a linear model. And the question is, can you do that? Is it the case that if the relationship between y and x does not appear to be linear, can you, can you not do OLS? Uh, and then, in fact, you, you can do OLS. What you can do is to try to transform uh, the variable uh, x uh, in from a, just its basic incarnation as x to something a little bit more uh, richer in order to be able to represent the non-linearities and yet estimate a linear model. So this is why the linear model is beautiful because uh, it actually doesn't restrict us to estimate linear things. We can just modify x to go back to a linear model. So there are only two things you could do uh, to do that, two ways to go, and I'm going to briefly talk about both ways to go. The first thing you could do is to say, as you know, any functions can be approximated by polynomials. So the first thing you could do is to uh, uh, regress y not on the x only, but on uh, polynomials of x, or in fact, polynomials of transformation of x's. And once you do that, you're back to an OLS. So the simplest way you could do that is to say, suppose I'm back to my gasoline example, which is actually a famous example because it's when uh, uh, where uh, Jerry Hausman and Whitney Newey, who are both econometricians in the department, developed a lot of the theory underlying not what I'm going to say in a few slides, which is series expansion. Uh, take your, you, know, you run your nonlinear regression, it looks kind of funny shape, not at all linear. So then you decide to run a y on a polynomials of x. Here I'm assuming that x is just a vector, not a matrix. So it's, for example, uh, 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 purchase of gasoline on the price of gasoline. Uh, so we have uh, the price of a constant, the price of gasoline, the price of gasoline square, cubic, and any number you, you want to put in. So you could put straight polynomials in there, or you could do uh, 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 orthogonal polynomials, or uh, whatever transformation of x that you want. Uh, if you assume that the model is known, for example, you assume that it's really a square or it's a cubic, then you're back to straight OLS, nothing, to, nothing special. You just have OLS, but your y variable the, the, is, is regressed on three regressors, which happens to be x, x square, and x cube. So all the theory that we have gone through goes through without any change. Uh, it's just that you, can, you, you assume that uh, uh, y and x are uh, related by this uh, particular shape. So we are, you're good. You may once you've done it, once you've estimated your polynomials, you can plot it by uh, uh, taking for a, a number of ranges, say, of the price of gasoline, the predicted value uh, for uh, for demand based on this coefficient. Well, you have estimated uh, beta zero hat, beta one hat, beta two hat, and beta three hat. Let's say if you have done a cubic. So you can plot it. You can take the derivative, because we know how to take the derivative of this thing. So it's very nice. So that's easy, just same. If you assume that the model is not known, in particular, you don't know how many, what is the real functional form. You just don't know. 
we want to approximate it with these polynomials, uh, then we then you can still do a linear model. You don't have to do a kernel regression. You can do a linear model and just add uh, powers in the x2, x3, x4, x5, etc., till you have the, the shape you, you like. And then the question you might want to ask is, well, but how many should I add if I don't know the... Uh, do you have... Uh, does anybody have an idea of how many you should ha add and how we should think... we should even think about it? When do I stop? So if I know the shape, I know it's a cubic, I just put a cubic. If I don't know the shape, then when do I stop adding polynomials? Yeah, go ahead. We want to minimize the variance. So if we are adding a lot of polynomials, the variance so almost. Go ahead. My thought was is the size of the coefficient, like if it's larger, then it's probably relevant. If it's not. I see. You want to look at the coefficients. Uh, I assume one might do that. He was a little bit closer to the way that is conventionally done. Yeah. We're going beyond the cube to basically be more stretched stretched versions of cubes and squares. No. Yeah. Maybe looking at uh, the plausibility and missing everything. Um, possibly. Lisa? Well, machine learning, what people do is optimize what their data set into a test set and a yeah, so we could we could possibly go a machine learning way to train the data set. We're not going to do that for this because we actually have a theory which is uh, which helps us think about that directly without splitting the data set. Uh, what uh, what we can do is exactly what we did for kernel. It's exactly the same problem. He was he had about half of the answer. The other half is that well we have the variance. You know the more polynomial the, he had the squigglier our function is going to be. On the other hand, we also have bias because we don't know the actual shape of the function. So if we don't do enough polynomial, we have bias. So we need to minimize some combination of bias and variance. What is our standard way to do that is mean squared error. So we're going to try and minimize mean squared error. How do we minimize mean squared error? Exactly like we did with kernel regression, which is we're looking at a cross-validation uh, criteria. We calculate, uh, we calculate the, the sum of the estimated mean square, and at some point we stopped when we have uh, enough polynomial. So, they are, uh, so that's exactly how we're going to pick the polynomials. Other than that, that we need to pick the polynomials, the behavior of this, uh, this linear uh, expansion is very, very, very similar to OLS. So the theory is a little uh, more involved because we have bias that remains, but the bias will, will go away as you add more observations and uh, it goes away. Uh, uh, and, the, and the variance, of course, will also go down as you add more observations. So basically, it's the same idea as kernel. With the kernel regression, what you promise to do is to reduce the size of the kernel as, of the bandwidth as the number of observation increases. With polynomial regression, with series expansion, what you promise to do is to add more polynomial as your number of observation increases. So it's exactly the same, the same principle. And the nice thing of that is that that's very easy to manipulate in theory and in practice because it's just OLS. So it's even simpler than doing a kernel regression. Although, I mean, at the end of the day, it's R who does it, so R does a kernel or a series. But in terms of manipulating, it's easier to think about it. So it's very easy to take the derivative of this. Therefore, you can... You know, if you're interested, once you've estimated, you say, oh, suppose I'm interested in, uh, in the elasticity of demand with respect to the price. You can, you can get it straight from the function by taking the derivative. Okay. Uh, so what else could you do? You could take the log of x. You could interact uh, the x's in the same way that we see that we could interact dummies. Uh, you, can, uh, you can interact uh, uh, dummies with a, a linear and a dummy. The, the, we can interact the dummy with an x, any non, you know, any continuous x, and that's going to shift the slope uh, when, for when the group uh, turns to one, it's going to shift the slope. In the same way, you could you could interact two continuous regressors uh, such that the slope of one depends on the level of another. Uh, so if you have several x's <coughs> and you want to, uh, and you have. Uh, 
and it could be interacted in many ways, and they could be flex you know they could be flexible in many ways. Then you start to have potentially a lot of choices. As we know uh, from uh, what Sarah talked to us about, as you add more stuff in the regression, the R square will mechanically go up, uh, but the variant of all the quotient will go down because if we add irrelevant things, it's going it's eating up degrees of freedom. Uh, so we don't want to do an infinite number of those stuff. Uh, the issue is become how to choose. And that's where you know, Lisa's point about machine learning was just prescient. That's when machine learning tools, which we are going to uh, learn more about on Wednesday, can become useful, can become handy. So you might, uh, there are various tools. Some of them require training the, 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 on the part of the data set and then using the other one to estimate. Some of them actually doesn't even, need, doesn't even require that. Um, so that's kind of one way you could go, is uh, uh, first take uh, a series expansion if you have a single X, or uh, then start interacting them, interacting series expansion if you want to, etc. And all of that gets estimated by a linear model and therefore are easy to, to work with. The second thing you could do is using dummies for approximation. So for example, suppose that you have um, some uh, uh, function like this. Uh, and uh, uh, you want to work, for whatever reasons you don't, work with a, you want to, don't want to work with a polynomial, but you could say, well, let me uh, estimate, let me approximate, let me just partition the, uh, partition the, uh, the range of x's into a bunch of intervals. So this is what I have done here. I've partitioned the, the x's in a bunch of intervals, so there is a dummy uh, equal to 1, if x belongs is between uh, uh, x0 and x1, that's a dummy equal to 1. If x is between x0 and x1 and 0 otherwise, then I can have a second dummy which is equal to 1 if x is between x1 and x2 and 0 otherwise. And then a third dummy that will be 1 if x is between x2 and x3 and 0 otherwise, etc. So first thing we could do is to just regress our y on a bunch of dummies, on a bunch of those dummies. And here I have not put the intercept. So why didn't I put the intercept in this case? Why did I uh, know, uh, knowingly omit the intercept? Yes? Say it again. It may be a little ambiguous, like it introduces a lot of boundary conditions. Go ahead. It's not going to have to be constants, right, except for the first interval. Yeah, and, and, and practically, what is, if I put the intercept, what is it going to do? It's going to be zero. Even more than that? If I put the intercept on all the dummies? Oh. It's not going to run, yes, it's going to be multicollinear. So what I could do is to put the intercept and omit one of the dummies, then everything will be relative to that. For example, if I omit the intercept, if I put the intercept and om omit the first dummy, that's going to be exactly the same as running exactly that. Uh, so when I run this regression, I'm basically estimating points at various, uh, uh, at within, at each level. So it's going to be like this, this, or oh, it's a, uh, like this. Something like that. Okay? Uh, so that's one thing we could do. Another thing we could do, so that's not, that's, that's not bad, but it's not perfect because you can see that here there is a step. The, 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 uh, the thing is a step function. And some of the step, uh, they, they don't, they're not there in the real data. They're not there in the true data. I just made them up because I, I, I used the dummies. So instead, if, uh, what could I do instead of, um, of, of doing this, uh, just estimating with the dummies? With just the dummies to espouse the, 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 the shape of the form a little bit better, not have these like artificial steps. Parametrically fit within each interval. Yeah, exactly. So, what would be the simplest parametric fit? I could try to estimate a line uh, in between each thing. So, instead of estimating 
this, I could say I'm going to define a piecewise linear variable as a, a dummy interacted with the with the x uh, x. Well, this one, this guy should be a, should be a, a superscript a subscript uh, a dummy between uh, between those those two. So then, when I when I do that, what I estimate is instead of estimating these steps, I estimate a line. Something like that. Mine is not very good looking. Something like that. So here, we need to center the, um, center the variables. If we center the variables, as I, put, as I did here, <coughs> which is we remove the threshold every time, this is going to ensure that the two fit. Otherwise, every time it's going to go back to the dummies. So we're centering the variable by removing the threshold. Uh, this is this x2 here that is really not x squared. It's uh, the not x2. So we take the variable x minus the not, and then we have piecewise linear pieces that are attached to each other. Okay. So here now we have just by putting dummies and estimating a, uh, a linear regression where the regressors happen to be this little uh, little line. We have something that is entirely linear, and uh, and yet uh, espouses the kind of complicated shape of that function quite nicely. And there you can have again you can ask yourself the same question, which is that's all very nice, but how many intervals should we choose? And the answer is the same. It should be very familiar by now. Either you know, you assume you know, so by assumption you know what the interval should be, what are the relevant intervals. For example, because um, the shape of this function is given to you by, uh, <laughs> I have to invent what this function should be. What do you think this function is? Does anyone have an idea? I don't know. Yes. Age. Something as a function of age, very, very good. So for example, is your uh, speed of, uh, well, but then it goes, it goes back up again. Uh, uh, yeah, and then it flattens. So over the, <laughs> I'm trying to think of something. Or oh, let's say it's the the, the speed of uh, of uh, of. Uh, oh yes, I know what it is. It's um, the ratio of your uh, the the speed at which you can uh, move over uh, your IQ. So uh, uh, when you're uh, a baby, you can really cannot move uh, very much. And then it goes very up again as you start uh, walking. Uh, but you are uh, not very developed yet. So this is two. Uh, and then uh, it's, it flat actually, it should go down. Uh, and then it, the point is that it increases again later because you start getting a car. So this is the moment where you need to, uh, to take care of your children very carefully when they're two and just start walking and when they are 17 and start driving. So, uh, so suppose this is economic theory or in this case, I don't know, psychology gives us that, uh, that, uh, that idea. Then we, uh, uh, then we just set up the interval and we are going to go linear function in between the points, okay? <coughs> This is when I should have put a photo of my children. I was looking for a, an excuse to put a photo of my children since she put a photo of her dog. That would have been the, good, uh, that would have been the, the, the time. Um, so, we do, so, we, so suppose we know that, then we are just going to uh, impose it and run the regression like that. And then we just, again, are <coughs> purely in the OLS world, except we happen to have this function that, is, that, that has three, you know, uh, four pieces to it. So that's one. <coughs> or, uh, so then you cut it the way that theory tells us to cut it, and we are back to purely OLS world. Or we don't know, and we are trying to guess the shape of this function, and then we are back to what we just explained with series, or what we did with OLS, which is the more, we are now trying to guess the shape of the function, the smaller the interval, the more closely we are going to be to the shape of the function, so the less pass but the more variance for a given sample size because it's going to start uh, like trying to fit a little squiggles which might not be really there in the real function. Uh, so we, uh, we again have this same usual trade-off uh, between bias and variance and as the number of observations goes up, 
the, the, the interval size will go down. So in fact, what we, what we are doing here when we do that is run something called a, non, a third non-parametric method. We already seen kernel. You've seen series a minute ago. And this is local linear regression, which is uh, exactly the same as kernel. So we uh, uh, divide the, 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 the sample into, into bands. We use, uh, and then the bandwidth will go down as the number of submissions goes up. Uh, based on the cross-validation criteria, exactly as I kernel, except that instead of running, um, instead of taking the average of the y, which is the kernel method, where we take a weighted average of the y uh, within the bandwidth that we are looking at, we run a look, we run a little linear regression of the y on the x in that interval, still weighting it such that the the, the observation nearer to the x have more weight. And we take the predicted value of this function as our prediction for y, for this point. So it's very, very similar to kernel, except that instead of being uh, uh, a mean, we're taking a, a linear uh, regression. It turns out that this is actually a much better way to do things than, uh, than uh, kernel regression at the boundaries. Because the problem at the boundaries is that kernel regression is taking a weighted a, a weighted mean, but there's nothing to the right, so it only takes the left, and therefore it has a lot of bias at the boundaries. Uh, so uh, the regression doesn't have that problem because it's extrapolating. So it is not uh, biased at the, at the boundaries, so it is an advantage of, of, uh, of local linear regression. You might say, well, most of the time I don't really care about the boundaries, it is what it is anyway, and there are not so many observations anyway, so there is Lots of variants, there is nothing I can learn from the boundaries, so kernel is going to do just fine. But one specific example where it's going to matter a lot is one we are going to see in a minute, which is where for some reason there is, a there is something in the middle of the data where there is a jump. For example, uh, your probability to, to get admitted to a, to a school, to a particular school, say Boston Latin, strictly depends on the score at an exam. So your probability to be admitted to the school goes from zero to uh, something positive at the score. That's a probability to be admitted. So if I look at a SAT score later, I'm going to find if Boston Latin is in fact uh, uh, effective, I would find something where uh, it goes like this and then it jumps at the boundary. It jumps at the threshold. So here, and I'm going to describe that in, in much more details in a minute, but if that's the world, I'm particularly interested in what's happening here. So I wouldn't want to use anything like a kernel over here because I'm going to get bias on both ends, so I'm not learning anything useful. So local linear regression has become a very popular tool among economists rather than kernel. Also, if you can run a kernel, you can run a local linear regression because it's really just the same. Another advantage of it is that we get the, the derivative of the function is simply the coefficient on the, on the local linear piece. So sometimes, often we are interested in derivatives and we get it free of charge instead of having to recalculate it. So for this reason, people, uh, people, like, this, uh, people like this. So this is why on earth would you like to do that uh, for, these two, for these two reasons. So all of that to say uh, was to try to sort of uh, gives you both a sense of how uh, flexible the, the OLS model is and how rich it is, and how everything is connected in a way between uh, non-parametric uh, uh, OLS model and even uh, machine learning. Now I want to put all of this functional form discussion we've had uh, together uh, to discuss one tool that has become very popular in applied research in recent years, which is called regression discontinuity design. So it's really a nice example of applying all of this method of, uh, of, of playing with functional form and dummies, et cetera, to understand something. So regression discontinuity design is appropriate in any circumstance, such as the Boston Latin example, where there is some treatment, for example, being admitted in Boston Latin, which shift discontinuously with some running variable at a threshold. So call the variable A, but that's because I'm, I'm using the someone else notation. Usually we use uh, X notation, but call this variable A for some reasons. And call your treatment DA equal A1. If A is greater than some threshold, 
For example, here I put the threshold as 21. <coughs> uh, let's call the threshold uh, uh, alpha 0 and uh, 0 otherwise. So uh, we are going to use as an example, a very nice, uh, nicely done example in uh, Josh Angrist's uh, and Steve Pischke's, Pischke's book, uh, Master of Metrics. They, they, they kind of dissect a nice article by uh, Carpenter and Dobkin on uh, blah, which I'm going to ask you in a minute. Uh, so it happens to be here that the threshold is 21, and dA is equal to 1 if you are above the threshold and 0 otherwise. Uh, what do you think the treatment is in that example? Something of interest that shifts discontinuously at 21. Yeah. Drinking age. Drinking age, exactly. So this is, this is something that is uh, relevant to many of you. So you pay close attention, even if you're not interested in econometrics. Uh, DA is 1 above 21 and 0 otherwise. So the idea is that we're going to look at an outcome. What do you think, what would be an interesting outcome to look at that is related to drinking age? Hospitalizations. Yeah, or, uh, or even one step further. Uh, yeah, so uh, they look at fatalities, actually. They, they look at, uh, they look at uh, uh, motor vehicle uh, uh, fatalities. Uh, and the idea is that as you become, so that's related to my, uh, to my, uh, example, with, um, to my example with mobility over IQ. Uh, so the, uh, well, that's not, it's, I guess because it's IQ that goes down once you've drunk. Uh, so the idea is that uh, as people become older, they probably become more reasonable uh, and better drivers. So a motor vehicle accident should in general probably go down with, with age. Except that at 21, something discreet happens, which is you get, uh, you get uh, your, uh, the, the right to drink. So you might be, uh, you might be uh, starting to drink, uh, drink and drive at 21, which was not possible before. So the idea is the in regression discontinuity design is that you assume that your outcome of interest does vary with something that determine that is going to influence whether or not you're treated or not. So the potential outcome is related to whether you're treated or not because the same thing that affects the potential outcome also affects the treatment. <laughs> but there is a discontinuity jumps and the assumption that we are willing to make is that there is no other reason for the discontinuous jump other than the, the fact that the treatment has changed. So there is no other reason why you would become a worse driver at 21 other than you might, be, uh, you might have uh, uh, drunk before. Uh, you might have been able to buy alcohol before. Uh, so this is an, this is an, this is, it's important to know that this is always an assumption that there is no shift at 21 in the outcome variable. And that the assumption is not usually directly testable. You have to appeal to your knowledge of the institution to know that it is likely to be a valid assumption. Sometimes you can provide some little auxiliary regressions to, uh, to give you confidence in the assumption, but that's always an assumption. So what can you do in this setting? Well, the simplest thing you can do is to use a dummy variable for uh, treatment to shift the intercept at uh, A0. So what you assume is that uh, you, the, the, we're running the, the regression that we saw with dummy variable. We assume that the shift, the, the slope of the relationship between your outcome on the left and on the right of the discontinuity is the same. But then there is a treatment. It suddenly shifts up uh, or down uh, depending on, the, on whether you can drink. So given what you were discussing before, before I show up the graph, uh, how do you think that uh, motor vehicle fatalities would, will look like as a function of age? Uh, uh, if I'm, uh, I'm taking the predicted value from this regression, what will the, putting 21 here, how, is it, how should it look like? Yes, exactly. So it's, going to, it's decreasing till here. Then maybe it's going to shift up because of the uh, ability to drink and it's going to be decreasing again. Uh, so this is a regression that you uh, rarely see in practice because quickly enough people go and do more richer stuff. But the very nice thing about uh, Josh's book is that he's going step by step and this is the graph that he ran for us. Uh, so the dots are uh, 
uh, for each age, uh, what is the average uh, death rate from, uh, from all cause, actually. Uh, and uh, uh, the, um, the lines is the predicted value from this regression and uh, with, the, with the jump, with the intercept shift over here. So that's the simple thing you can do. So here, you've, you, this, these lines are parallel because you've assumed that they were parallel, OK? Uh, the estimated lines are parallel. In fact, if it's not a bad, uh, it doesn't seem to be a very bad approximation of the graph, but it's assumed in this case. Yes? Very similar to the China example, exactly, exactly. This is exactly the same idea. Uh, what I was just describing about Boston Latin, very similar. So it's very, very popular. People use it uh, at boundary. Oops. Uh, the, the, um, so that's the simplest thing you can do. And in this case, it's sort of nice. Uh, it's a nice, uh, it, it looks uh, reasonably convincing that, uh, that there is a sh shift upwards in mortality right at 21. <coughs> However, the, the simplest analysis may get it wrong. So this is, these are fake examples. Uh, these are fake examples of data where uh, non-linearities may disguise themselves as discontinuity. So if you're look, looking at the top graph, it, I, if, I force the, if I force the data to, if I force the data to be, uh, uh, to have a jump, it might think that there is a, it might think that there is a discontinuity, but in fact, it's just that, uh, it might just be a non-linearity but because, because I force linear on both sides and I force it to be with the same slope, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that there is a jump where in fact really, so when I estimate my regression, I'm going to really see a nice significant jump when in fact in reality it's a kind of, it would be, a, it, it could just be a, a well captured by a smooth quadratic. It's very clear as well here that uh, if, you, if you force here, it's not estimated linearly, but if you, uh, on this one, see if you force a linear trend, you're going to see a, you're going to see a jump. But in fact, if you did something more flexible with, you know, with just a cubic or a cubic and a quartic, you would see that it's just a shape that is uh, that is nonlinear. So that's kind of a problem we might have if we run regression discontinuity analysis by imposing a linear trend on both sides. So what do we do? Well, we try to avoid imposing a linear trend on both sides. So the first thing you could do is to say, well, I'm going to add polynomials, exactly as we said. You could either estimate it on either side, on the same one on both sides, uh, so estimate the same polynomial on both sides of the discontinuity. I think this is what is being done here in the second graph, uh, and imposing a jump. Or even better, you could say, well, let me estimate a poly So under, the, under H0, the hypothesis that there is no discontinuity, that's clearly the right thing to do. Or even better, you could be even more flexible and say, let me estimate a polynomial that is uh, uh, going to be different on either side. So you center the variable, as we discussed previously, such that uh, the, the piece of the polynomial uh, uh, meet each other. And you run a regression where uh, you have uh, AI minus A0, and then uh, AI minus A0 above the, above the threshold, AI minus A0 square, AI minus A0 above the threshold uh, uh, square, etc. And here you can, uh, you, can, you can do just, uh, you can do this version without the dot, where you have a linear, linear piece on both ends, but you're not assuming it to be the same. Or you can be more flexible, you can have a quadratic on either side, for example. Here again, so this is an example of, of that. Uh, this is the same data we saw earlier, but now we estimate a linear model on both sides, but it's, uh, it's not the same slope. So we are allowing the slope to be different on either side by interacting uh, with the, by centering the variables and then interacting with the treatment dummies. And then the, the graph that is a little bit uh, smoother is a quadratic on either side, a different quadratic on either side. You can see here that it makes no difference because it seems to be a nice linear functional, li nice linear line either way that's almost parallel except for the jump. Okay? So, uh, so that is, that's what you, one could do. 
uh, sometimes uh, by doing that make your discontinuity disappear, so it's a little bit sad, but that is life. Uh, once you run that, uh, what is of interest? So you always want, if you're interested in doing regression discontinuity for your paper, all the power to you, that's great. You don't have to find something, it could be a zero, no problem at all. That's actually a general point. Don't feel that you have to deliver a result that is not zero. We like zeros, I love zeros, I don't see, I think that there is not enough in, around, so just show us zero, no problem. But if you're showing an, a regression discontinuity, I want a graph. You cannot do a regression discontinuity analysis without a graph. If you don't see it in the graph, it's not there, even if it's in the table with significant numbers. So it's very important to show the graph. But then typically with a graph, you're also going to show uh, some numbers. Uh, uh, so let's, uh, let's go over this table. So each row in this table is a different outcome. Okay, so this is not your typical way that regression are represented where in the row we have the, the different x's. Here each row is a different regression, okay? Uh, so each row is a different regression. Each column, uh, column one and two are uh, looking at age 19 to 22, so above the, around the discontinuity. Column three and four are restricting to age 20 and 21. Uh, and uh, it's an age in month over these two things. Column one, uh, you have uh, just the age. So this is a linear on both sides without imposing the same slope, the first model we looked at. Column two is age and age square interacted with over 21 dummy. So that's the second model we saw with more flexible control. Uh, you can see that uh, the first uh, row is uh, all death, and so what we have in the coefficient is the jump uh, measured after uh, those controls. And so we have, for example, for the first row, uh, first column, uh, the effect of um, the effect of uh, 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 of the 21 of becoming 21 and therefore being allowed to to drink is 7.66 and I think it's per thousand or per hundred thousand or something it's per some large number uh, uh, and it's very very significant you have the standard error below uh, so uh, if you divide one by the other it's something that is going to be quite large so you can definitely reject the hypothesis that it has no the drinking age uh, has no effect so keep that in mind uh, and uh, be careful. And you have, uh, so once you've done that, <coughs> the good thing with the, with the, with the, uh, with the, this var particular variable, again, you cannot test the hypothesis that there is no discontinuity, uh, that, that there is no other reason for the discontinuity except the drinking age. Uh, but if uh, that were the case, then stuff that is not related to alcohol shouldn't jump. So uh, what you look at, so what you can look at is other outcomes. So first of all, because you were thinking that most of these things come from motor, motor vehicle accidents, you can see that uh, the coefficient for motor vehicle accident is in fact very large and significant at second line. Uh, suicide is also actually uh, affected by, by, uh, by alcohol. You could say, well, that's a, a fail, but probably uh, alcohol is involved in some uh, uh, suicide cause. Homicide is not at all significantly related, so it's not violence in general. Uh, other, um, uh, all internal causes, so definitely should not be affected, uh, is completely unaffected. And of course, alcohol-related causes, alcohol-related that are not uh, motor vehicle accidents or, or death, so for example, uh, people passing out in a coma and dying is, is a much smaller number because it doesn't happen very frequently, but it's also quite significant. So this gives you, so looking at the other variable is not a proof that the uh, specification is correct, but it gives you some confidence. So that's the first way to solve this problem is to impose a polynomial. Second way to solve this problem is by narrowing the estimate to a band around the discontinuity. That's going to be our bandwidth. And as usual, you're going to make the bandwidth smaller and smaller. So look at the lower and lower bandwidth around the discontinuity uh, as you have more observation. So that becomes non-parametric regression discontinuity design. So parametric reg regression discontinuity design is when you use a bunch of your data 
and impose a polynomial form on both sides. And non-parametric is then we reducing your bandwidth. And then what you do typically is estimating a local linear regression, as we just discussed, uh, on either side. And you're reducing the bandwidth as much uh, when you have more and more and more observation. Okay, so it's again very, very similar, but it's just you're reducing the size. Uh, so in my series of uh, advertising uh, uh, graduate student work that, that could give you, uh, give you idea of uh, things to do, here is a regression discontinuity design that uh, uh, Melanie over here uh, found, uh, which is uh, looking at something that's a popular design for regression discontinuity, a popular place where you find discontinuities is elections. Because in elections, the first person wins, and the second person loses, irrespective of how close they are from the first person. So that creates a discontinuity, assuming that there is a bit of randomness in uh, whether some supporters are going to vote that day or not, etc. cetera. Uh, that creates uh, potentially very discontinuity, discontinuous outcome at 50% if it's two candidates, or at whatever the margin of victory is. Uh, so people have looked this in political science, regression discontinuity is really a tool of choice in the last few years as people look at the effect of Democrats versus Republicans, having the unions or not, uh, incumbency effect, so being the winner rather than the loser of an election, etc. So what Melanie looked at is uh, the effect of winning an election on the decision to run again not on winning conditional on having uh, uh, conditional on running, but on the decision to run again. So w which way do you think it goes, like if you narrowly win an election versus narrowly lose an election? Which makes you more likely to run again the next election? Winning, winning yeah. So the, w the, winning are, the winners are generally, uh, are generally more likely to run. Uh, so what she is interested in is to see whether that's, that, that's different for men and for women. Whether the winning uh, margin, the, whether the effect of winning an election is different for men and for women. So she uses data that's all publicly available. So local election returns from 1995 to 2012. Uh, uh, and um, now there is even a few more. This is where the data is available. Uh, this is a bunch of elections like school board, city councillors, this type of stuff. Uh, so very, very local election. The first entry, usually for people, the first entry point into politics, some local, uh, local elections. Sometimes for a lot of people, actually, the last entry point into politics. Mm -hmm. uh, a nice, interesting uh, way, reason why these are interesting elections is that they are usually not party line based. Uh, it's a lot of individual decision whether to run or not. So the interpretation of the result will be a little bit cleaner in terms of people's own decision as opposed to party deciding to feel people or not feel them. So here is what we find in graph. What has she done here? Well, she's estimating uh, uh, um, uh, a parametric uh, RD for men and for women separately. Uh, the women are, on the, are the, 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 the green dots, the green diamonds, and the uh, men are the uh, uh, transparent, uh, transparent uh, round circles, and then they both have their uh, have the, 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 the polynomial uh, fit on both sides. I, th I think it's a, it's a cubic. We'll see, we'll see the regression in a moment. Uh, so it's a different cubic on both. It's a different polynomial on both sides, and it is different for men and for women. You could imagine running in it two separate regression, one for men, one for women. In fact, I'm going to show you that she does everything at once using interactions. So that's going to remind us how to use interactions as well. And so when you look at these graphs, uh, what do you, so let's focus, in, focus on this one. Uh, what's your sense of what we are going to find uh, in, uh, if you want, you can say for men, for women, and then the difference between the two? For the in in the in panel A here. Yep. Exactly. So men are more willing to to run again, even if they lost. So the, for both gender, how would I how would I describe this? I would say for both gender, there is a, a, a pretty steep decline in the probability to run again if they have uh, lost an election before, but the uh, the effect is larger for women. 
And interestingly, this is a one. This is the same number of operations, but if a, it's a one if you run and you win, and a zero if you don't run, and a zero if you run and you lose. And what do we have? What what's, what would be the conclusion? Do you think we don't have standard error on the graph? But what do you think the conclusion would be uh, when we are comparing these two? Maybe the women that run and win again are different than the women. Yeah, so first, let's interpret the basic fact. The basic fact is that from this graph is that actually, if we use one running and winning, the, there is no difference left between men and women at the discontinuity. So men are much more likely to, to run again if they've lost the election, but uh, they are not likely, they are not more likely to run and win, which as <laughs> we were told, uh, has to be mechanically due to the fact that um, the, the marginal loser among men is more likely to lose again if they run, uh, to lose next time they run than, than, if, uh, than the woman. So the, basically women do not run unless they are pretty sure that they, they, they have a good shot. So let's look at it in a, yes. Oh, I was just wondering, it just seems strange, why does, as the margin of victory increases for women, they're like less likely to yeah, it goes down again. So this this part of it, I have no idea what this is, uh, it, uh, and it's hard to interpret because uh, it might be that they it might be that they change elections. Also, they are not in the local election database. Maybe like the very very popular women are snapped snapped up by, par by parties to run and other things. So I have I have just no idea. It, it could also be very different people at this point. They might. Uh, this is hard to interpret causally because there is a lot of differences between people according to their margin of victories, uh, the jump we can interpret causally because we assume it is random. Uh. Question. All California, yeah. This is just for local election. Just for local election. So yeah, there's not the very possible that I see for they just get all this exactly. international elections. I think it is it is a plausible interpretation. Uh, I, I could dream up many other ones, but if you want to interpret this as causal, it's a plausible interpretation. So we could we could add them up too, especially in, in California. Yeah. Okay. So what do we see just as a term of writing it as a regression? So it's kind of a bit of a of a mouthful the regression if you want to uh, write everything together because we 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 are running it uh, together for men and women. So everything is interacted with the female dummy. So basically, the, if you remember how we interpret interaction with dummies, the, because here I'm putting fem a female dummy, all of the terms that are not interpret that are not interacted with the female dummy will give me the effect for for men, and then the ones that are interacted with the female dummy will give me the differential effect uh, for for a woman. So you have all the definition here. So the beta is going to be the effect of having lost for a man after controlling for uh, uh, the polynomial on the left side of the discontinuity. This is the eta case here. The polynomial on the right side of the discontinuities are the data case side. So the beta, etas, and thetas give me the effect for men. Uh, I mean, the beta is the effect for men, and the other ones are the, the, uh, the, the control for men. And then the gamma is the differential effect for f female, so it's going to be negative in the fact of running again. Uh, delta is just the fact that w women may be less likely to run in general. Uh, and then the, uh, uh, the, the, the control, I'm also interacting the control for female to make sure that I have the, the right control on both genders. So I'm, if I run exactly this regression, actually I'm going to get strictly the same coefficient and in F run two regression separately. Um, so here we have everything. Uh, the reason why we are not going to get, uh, we're running everything to there, we also include the year of election fixed effect. So it's a bunch of dummy for each year the election was run in case something is different. And then county fixed effect. Uh, forget about clustering, we didn't discuss that very much. And this is the, the way we, you would typically represent this type of regression, you don't plot the polynomials. You don't describe the polynomial in your, in, your, in your table. It's not very interesting. But you're saying, well, this is my polynomial. Here, I just put a linear term. This is a quadratic. This is a cubic. Uh, so I'm exploring the sensitivity to different type of poly polynomial. 
uh, and she reports the uh, effect of having lost. So remember how we in interpret lost, the lost dummy here, what's the interpretation of that? It's the effect of having lost election for For who? The lost dummy is the effect of having lost the election for, for males. Uh, the female dummy is what? The, probability, the difference between the probability that a female runs and a male runs among those who have won, uh, won before because it's not interacting with lost. And you can see that basically if they have, if they have won, they are just as likely to run as men. The female times lost is the extra effect of having lost for female. So if I wanted the overall effect of having lost for female, what would I do? What would I need to do? Minus female loss from female loss. Exactly, I'm adding them up. I need to add up the effect of lost and the effect of female time loss to have the overall effect for female. Because this, the interaction tells me that Female are 11% chance less likely to run than men if they have lost. Okay, so uh, on, on average they are so then in, in total they are 18% uh, or 28% less likely to run if they have lost than if they have won. Uh, and then you can see that uh, adding more polynomial doesn't seem to do too much to the interaction coefficient, which is nice. That's what we are interested in. Uh, and then you can see the coefficient of running and winning. There is still a, a negative coefficient in, and significant in the first column, but it disappears afterwards. So it seems that there is no additional female effect or it's, it becomes much smaller and insignificant for running and winning. Uh, so then you can think about how to interpret this, why it might be the case. There are uh, uh, any number of interpretation one could give. Yeah. Uh, so in a way, yes, what we are doing here is combining difference in difference with uh, a regression discontinuity framework. Because we are comparing the losers and the, uh, the losers uh, and the winners uh, for male versus for female. And we are saying, is it the case that the female uh, 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 losers are, are, are more likely to not run than the male losers. But in this case, we are not doing the difference in difference for identification purpose. We are just interested in the, in the, in the difference per se. The males are not a control here. They are something that they have their own effect and then the effect for female is even larger. Okay? So regression discontinuity is nice uh, because there are actually a lot, once you start looking for them, there are a lot of those discontinuity happening in, <laughs> in the world that we can, uh, we can exploit. One thing that you need to remember, two things that you need to remember, one is that the effect you're estimating are very, very local. They are right at the discontinuity. Sometimes it's a problem, sometimes it's not. Think about the Boston Latin example. <coughs> If you use the discontinuity to estimate the effect of going to Boston Latin, you're comparing the last student to be admitted in Boston Latin to the first student not to be admitted. And this effect might be quite different than the effect for, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, 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 the best children or even the average children admitted in Boston Latin. So if, if as a parent you're interested in whether you should go to, uh, you should attend Boston Latin as opposed to any other school, any other Boston public school, uh, maybe the regression discontinuity is, might not be relevant if your child is doing very well. Uh, in some cases, it doesn't matter, or in some cases, it's exactly what we're interested in. But it's worth remembering that. The other thing that is worth remembering is, again, this is an untest untested assumption and at very fundamentally untestable. Uh, so you need to argue your best that it's a plausible assumption in your context. Okay. I knew that I had some more material to cover from last time, but I didn't know that it was that many. Uh, so let's talk about omitted variable bias. Um, so I'll give you another example that comes from uh, uh, Angrist and Piske's book, uh, um, uh, again, because it's done in a very nice uh, pedagogical way, uh, uh, of the omitted variable problem. So. Uh, Imagine that you are interested in estimating the effect of attending a private university as opposed to a state school. 
on future earnings. And imagine that the true model, the true model that, you know, uh, in reality, the, the true model is this one, is uh, uh, alpha, a constant, plus beta going to private school. That's the effect of going to private school as opposed to a state school. I'll discuss that in a moment. But you need to account for the fact that people who go to private school are different. So in particular, people who go to private school may have higher SAT scores, SAT scores. And they may have different demographics. Their parents might be richer. They might be different, coming from different towns, et cetera, et cetera. So these are demographic. But think of this as parental income. So uh, I'll define the, the group, what the group, what this group thing is uh, right now. What is this group thing? It's a bunch of dummies, 150. And it's a group IJ is a dummy equal to one if students I belong to group J. So it's a set of group fixed effect. I had uh, condensed the interpretation by putting just uh, alpha J, you remember? So this is the dummy spelled out. And what are those groups? These groups uh, describe the set of schools that the students have applied to and where they were admitted. So basically, you have this is a data set called College and Beyond, where people were looked at in 1996. And these were people who applied to college in 1976. All of them applied to college in 1976. And what you know from every person is all the schools where they have been applied and all the schools where they were admitted. So the first thing that they do on these 151 dummies is separating the schools by state and private and by highly selective, kind of selective, not selective at all. And those dummies are described uh, exactly uh, with the type of schools that people have applied to. For example, uh, all the students which have applied to three selective schools and one non-selective school, and all of them were private schools, and got admitted to all the places that they applied to are in one group. And then you have another, another group made of uh, um, uh, one uh, state school and two private school, all of them selective and got admitted everywhere, is also another group. So you form groups like that. So a lot of groups have just one person. So these groups basically will drop out, these students will drop out from the regression because they have no one to be compared to. Uh, but some of the groups will have, uh, will have 150 groups have more, than, uh, have more than one person in them. So we are interested in beta here. We are not interested in any of this, in the effect of SAT. We are not interested in the effect of parental income in, uh, in future earnings. One might be, but in this case, let's say we are only interested in, uh, in, uh, in beta. So why are we putting all the other variables in the, in the full model? Why do the all, all other variables belong to the true model that describes our data? Why is it the true model as opposed to just uh, private school dummy? Yes, if we omit, so we are going to have, they, they belong there because typically, we'll go back to your potential outcome framework, typically people who, do, who go to private schools, private universities, are different than students who don't go to private, to go to state universities. First of all, they, they qualified, so they have uh, uh, large SATs, maybe they have larger SAT scores. Second of all, their parents can afford it, so maybe they are richer. And we think that maybe SAT score would have, would have an independent effect on your earnings. Uh, what, why do these guys belong to? We don't think that the, um, why do these, we, do we think that there is a causal effect of, there might be a causal effect of your parental income on your earnings because your parent can buy you a factory or something. Do we think there is a causal effect of the fact that you have, you applied to three schools, exactly three schools, and got admitted to two? No. So why do the group, what does the group do for us? Why is it, why do they really belong to this? Why do, where are they likely to belong to this model? Why is it the case that these dummies are, uh, might not be zero, that they, they really belong to the model? Earnings, and we have some student who is highly desired by colleagues that might be indicative. Exactly. If conditional on SAT, a student, for example, got admitted everywhere they, they applied, then uh, that suggests that there is something about that student that may have been in their essay, 
Uh, by the way, if you do read this chapter, there is a fantastic essay for a 19-year-old who subsequently went to NYU. So you see, you see this essay and you really want, you think this, this person is going, to, is going to do well in life. Uh, so, of course, we don't see the essay in the regression, but the fact that someone got admitted everywhere they applied might indicate something about their potential earnings irrespective of their education. Okay, so that's one. And then, uh, so that's the admission part. And then even the, in the application part, do you think there is something in the application part? Yeah. Motivation. Exactly, motivation, ambition, etc. So people who, it, it could be that people who apply to more schools just are, um, you know, are go-getters. Or it could be that people who apply to just one school and it happens to be MIT are, uh, are, uh, know exactly their worth. Or whatever it is, we don't need, the beauty of it is we don't need to exactly understand what's the mechanics of it because we're not interested in the group dummies per se. But we're thinking that there might be a lot in the, in those group dummies that represent the something about the student. So assume that happens to be the true model, that God told you this is the true model. Now we argued it because God has not told me anything of the sort, but, uh, but we, we, this is the true model. But imagine that we don't have this, all these variables. In particular, it's going to be very rare to have the uh, to have the uh, all these application dummies. So typically, in the typical data set, we might have earnings and whether they went to a private school or a state school. Maybe if we're lucky, we also have the SAT score. Maybe if we are very lucky, we have parental income. And we are unlikely to have all these group dummies. In this case, we happen to be able to compare for pedagogical purposes. But in a lot of cases, we won't have the group dummies. We would like to put them in, but they are we just don't have them. So what happens when we, when we run this regression? Uh, I want you to start maybe with uh, the uh, column six. Column six has estimates the true model, which has uh, all of the group dummies are over here. They are not reported because that would be a lot of coefficients. So this is how we report in a regression, selectivity group dummies, yes. Then we have uh, private school dummies. This is what we are interested in. We have the student set score. We have the parental income and a bunch of other demogra de demographics, race, uh, uh, top school, uh, top percent of the high school, high sc uh, blah, blah, blah. So uh, that's the truth. Uh, how do you interpret the first coefficient here? Yeah. Question about one of the very high yeah. school rank missing. That doesn't mean the data is missing. It means the data is missing. So uh, we don't want to drop the data. We don't want to drop the guy since we're not so interested in that, uh, in that variable per se. If it happens to be missing, we can just fill it up with zeros and add a dummy for whether this is missing. That way we don't lose the observation, uh, but we estimate the coefficient properly for the, for the person. We didn't, we didn't go over missing data, so that's, but that's a good question. So the high school, missing is a, high school rank missing is a dummy that the high school rank is missing. And therefore, that this one was filled up with a zero. Okay, so let's focus on the coefficient beta here, or uh, in model uh, six, which is the true model. Uh, what's the effect of private school on future earnings? Yeah. Tell us that your earnings are one point three percent higher than you to a private school. Exactly. And what is the standard error of that number? Two point five percent. So is it? Uh, can we reject the hypothesis that the private school has, has no impact? No, so I'm very sorry, uh, but there is actually no effect of, uh, uh, it seems that in the true model, there seems to be no effect of going to private school over a state school in the true model. What's the number, real quick, we were looking for, we're comparing 2.5% to 0.05%? No, we're comparing the ratio of uh, uh, 1.3 to 2.5, which is going to be about a half. Uh, we're comparing that to, uh, if you're interested in 5% uh, level, we're comparing that to 1.96. So this is the typical I'm doing. Uh, you will become very conversant with doing this in your head. Uh, we just do it all the time. Uh, divide the coefficient by the standard error. You get a t-statistic. The t-statistic is uh, 0.5. Is it larger than 2 or smaller than 2? 
to it's 1.96 if they are normally distributed, which is probably true. It's the largest sample anyway. So you can think of 1.96 being the threshold. Is it below 1.96 or above 1.96? It's much below 1.96. So even if this regression, ha this table had stars, <coughs> which it doesn't because it just shares my opinion about stars, uh, you will, uh, you would, uh, you would, uh, you would not have a star here. In your paper, you should put stars. So that way, you will get, uh, uh, you will get used to put stars uh, to, to 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 do these calculations. So this has zero stars. It's 1.3 percent. If you went to private school, it's not very large, and it's uh, not significant. Now go back to uh, the first colon where we are just putting it the private school dummy, and there, what do we find? We find 13.5 percent, and that is very significant. So if here we've estimated the, the true model, there is no effect. But when we omitted a bunch of the control that we should have put in, uh, we, are seeing, uh, uh, we are seeing a very large effect. And what this suggests is that this effect actually is a biased number coming from the fact that we haven't controlled for stuff that we should control for. And you can see it. Now we're going to go progressively from column 1 to column 6. You can see it that already when we put the student SAT score, the effect go from 13.5% to 9.5%. Uh, adding the parental income and the other demographics uh, do a little bit more. And then adding the group dummy, which is going from this guy to equation six, that's where the coefficient really goes down all the way to zero. So that's just the group dummies that capture like the spunk of the student on the one hand and their desirability, as you pointed out, on the other hand, makes a big difference. Another thing that is pretty interesting, and we'll go back to that uh, in a minute, is that once you've introduced those group dummies, actually adding the SAT and the parental income doesn't make a big difference. So the group dummies, the application behavior, plus whether or not they were admitted, seem to be doing enough of a job, too. So what I, I want to do, so this is the omitted variable problem in a nutshell. If you omit variables that really should be in the model, the coefficients are very biased. And then uh, this one tells us a slightly more complicated story because we know that they belong to the model. They are significant in the, in the, um, the SAT score and parental income are significant in the decisions to, in the earning regression. But yet, they don't belong once we put here. So we'll need a little bit more math before we understand that, that number, which I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes. So what is happening? So by the way, uh, a note that is important is that when we do the group dummies, we are missing a lot of observations because anybody who is in a group of one disappears. So it turns out that we can pretty much capture all of what the group dummies do for us by putting uh, a much uh, sparser control that we can have for all observations. So we are comparing really the same sample. So the average set score where you applied, when you send two applications, send three applications, send four or more applications. So these are dummies for that you send uh, uh, two applications, three applications, or four or more. That's pretty much enough to capture all of the group dummies. So the, the story that we gave is exactly the same, that we go from uh, uh, very large regression, very large impact. This is now the same sample where all of these are defined. So the coefficient here is a little bit different to what we had before, which was in the entire sample. Uh, and we go from 21% premium to uh, a true one that is 1.7%. Uh, uh, so this is the regressions that we, this, these are the, the, the difference that we are actually going to try to explain uh, now. So uh, now for some formula, I'm going back to our familiar notation uh, for writing down the formula. Uh, suppose the correct model has an x1, which you happen to be interested in, an x2 that really belong there, but for some reason you're not going to put in. For example, typically because you just don't have them uh, in your data set. And you estimate a model that uh, has just the x1. Uh, I want you to define the uh, ancillary regression as a regression of x2 on x1. Okay. Uh, and then you're getting this interesting 
um, formula, which is the omitted variable bias, which is the effect, the, the estimated alpha minus uh, the true coefficient, which is your bias, is delta 1 times uh, beta 2. So in other words, the omitted variable bias depends in this very simple way of the influence of the omitted variable on the outcome and the influence of the x1 on uh, x2. Given that we don't have a huge amount of time, I might not go over the math of that, but I'll show it. It's in the slide and show it to you in a minute. But I want you to think about how, what's the intuition for this result. Correlation of the omitted variable with the coefficient. Yeah, so that's just restating the results. But what? Uh, so how do we give? Uh, how do we give? Uh, what's the intuition? So the intuition is that on the one hand, if we omit a variable that really doesn't matter, then it shouldn't matter. Okay, fine. On the other hand, if the variable that we omit is totally uncorrelated with what we put in, it doesn't matter either. Where it is going to matter is when it's very correlated with what we are trying to put in. Basically x1 is going to have a very large coefficient because it's pulling the effect of, of x2. So it's basically pulling with it a bunch of stuff that doesn't really belong to it. So that's why we have this product, is when uh, the two, so for example, if you're looking at the data set of kids and you just have height and you don't have age, you might think, and you're looking at the performance on some additions on height, and you might think, wow, height is really correlated with performance on addition. Well, it's because uh, height is very correlated with age, and age is, is very correlated with addition results. So uh, when you put in the height, height is un, you know, unbeknownst to you, or perhaps beknownst to you, uh, really proxying for the age. And so that's why the coefficient becomes large, even if the true coefficient is zero. So that's the formula. That's, that's just a, a, a really uh, great, because uh, once you have this formula, typically you don't have x2, otherwise, again, it would be in the regression. Uh, but the formula helps us think about whether we should be worried about x2 and in what way. Um, the, the, the math for it is, is really, really simple. Uh, so we don't need to go over it. It's, it's going to be in the slide. This is, I put in for you the bivariate, bivariate, bivariate derivation and the multivariate derivation. So it's in the slide, and it's easy. It's better to spend our last uh, three minutes uh, to look back at our college example and see how it works. So this is a special example, because in this case, we have the omitted variable. We have the variable that would be omitted uh, uh, usually. So what we can do is to run the auxiliary regression. So I'm going to run uh, what happens when I'm going to run the set score on, uh, on, private on the private school uh, dummy and the parental income on the private school dummy. So let's say, suppose I omit the SAT score and I'm running the, in the short model where I didn't have the group dummies, I omit the SAT score. The effect uh, delta one here is 1.165. So people who, have, uh, who, uh, who are going to private school tend to have higher test, test scores naturally. So a pretty large uh, coefficient. Uh, remember, this is table uh, two, three that we are trying to compare to. Remember, we have uh, uh, um, 0.21 without controlling for SAT, and then uh, 0.15 with controlling for SAT. So what we're hoping is that the difference between the two is equal to a delta <coughs> one which is uh, 1.165 uh, times the coefficient of uh, uh, um, the uh, SAT in the regression. Uh, and then, uh, miraculously, it's actually uh, correct. So you can see that uh, you can see the anatomy of the omitted variable bias in this regression. Another thing that you can see from this regression is why the application dummies help, because uh, we, we have seen that the, the, the set score do, does matter. So why is it that it doesn't matter once we have the application dummy? It's because once we control for the application dummy in the regression, the SET score uh, 
in column three here, we're controlling for the application dummy in the regression. And you can see that controlling for all the application dummy, the SCT score is not significantly related to the, to the uh, uh, private score dummy. So in the omitted variable regression, in the omitted variable bias formula, what is happening here is not that beta 2 is 0. Set score does belong in an regression, but delta 1 is 0 once we have all the, so in other, once we have all the school dummies, the application dummies. In other words, the application dummies are, are doing a very good job capturing what should be in there, which is why the omitted variable bias disappears with the application dummies. So, um, So how, what, how do we use the omitted variable bias in general? Most of the time, we don't have these variables. So otherwise, we would include them in the first place. So why is the omitted variable useful? So it's useful because it guides our economic thinking on whether the bias should be important or not. When we're thinking that we're omitting something, is it something that we should worry about or not? Are we omitted variables that are important determinant of the outcome? And are they likely to be correlated with the regressor's interest? I'm going to skip the example, but that's very fun. Like, this is, if you read the well blog, I love the well blog on the New York Times. I actually, for, I actually do like it. But one of the things that's very funny is that if about every other day, there is, um, there is an article that gives you a, good, a nice example of omitted viable bias. So here is a, a high fat diet may lead to daytime sleepiness. Might well be true, but the way this is, this is based on a regression where 1,800 men who had filled out full frequency questionnaire and reported how sleepy they felt during the day. So it turns out people who uh, have more fatty diet also feel sleepy. This is controlling for a bunch of stuff. You could well imagine a number of omitted variable bias here. Mm -hmm. um, but there is one every other day, like coffee makes you live longer, whatever. Um, might well be true, but it's <laughs> this is usually on this uh, based on these regressions, and that's a big problem with epidemiology in, in general. That it's just you know comparing people who are having very different behavior, and maybe there is a lot of omitted variable bias here. I want to I want to go over this slide quickly because this is our introduction for Sendil. Um, some hints of more advanced techniques to deal with omitted variable bias. Um, first of all, you could so you could know exactly which variable belong. Uh, but there could be very many, and you might be wondering how to deal with them because the, you don't want a very, very, very long regression because it's going to be very imprecise for your coefficient of interest to add a lot of regressors. So in this case, one thing you can do is uh, called matching, uh, which is uh, first run a regression which you can make as non-parametric as you want of your uh, of uh, the uh, probability to be treated or your, your, your variable of interest, say the probability to go to private school on a bunch of uh, characteristics, take the predicted value from this regression and then control flexibly, for example, with polynomial, with a series expansion, or, or on this probability. So you do it in two steps. You first run a, as complicated as you want, messy regression of the probability to go to private school, say, on the regressors and then take the predicted value of that and just stick it in the regression. You know, it could, it would seem magic that it works, but it works. It's a result due to, due to Rubin. And then this is why I want this slide is uh, another thing you could do is try machine learning techniques, which is in a situation you would do when you have potentially lots and lots and lots of X's, but you do not know uh, which one belong then you could use machine learning techniques to, so of course you're still interested in, in your private school, but you could do machine learning technique to select which one belong in the model. Depending on the technique you use, you might use, you might do that in a training data set, as Lisa was describing to us, and then running the regression in the full data set. What I want to say about both of these techniques is that in both cases, they are just as good as the variable you do have at your disposal. And the question, you can add as much you know, niceties as you want, but uh, um, the question is always going to be, what is it that is not in my data set which should really be there? And is it likely to be important or not important? In some cases, it's not going to be important. You are pretty confident that you have a lot of stuff. 
are, in some cases, uh, it might be important, in which case uh, you might decide that you don't know until you run an experiment or until you find another method. Uh, so that's where we are now. So we'll see uh, Sandy on, on, on Wednesday.